Good morning and uh, welcome everyone. Trust that uh, everyone can hear clearly, both here on campus as well as online batch. So today we will begin with apostolic uh, ministry. There are a couple of chapters towards the end of uh, the Understanding the Prophetic book, which will be done as recordings, one or two. This week I'll put it up so you can go through it. Uh, but the good thing is that since there were many questions, we have kind of addressed those issues, those um, subjects in our discussions itself. So you may not find it hard to understand it. But if you have a query, you can always leave uh, a note on the Google Classroom or even ask here in the class. We'll address it. Okay. So today, uh, since we are going to start the apostolic, the first thing that we would need to do is to just download the notes. Okay. Could you please do that from Google Classroom? In the classwork section, I've posted it. For the e-learning students, it will be available on e-learn. So once you download it, you can follow along as we talk about the apostolic. So let's um, pray and uh, get right into the subject. I'll begin with a word of prayer. Abba Father, we thank you, we worship you, we honor you, God, for, um, uh, Lord, your grace upon our lives. And Father, once again, Lord, we thank you for, uh, um, Father, the very breath in our lungs that we are able to be here. Lord, learning your word, we pray that, um, Lord, um, the power of the word, Lord, will be released into our hearts and lives. And Father, as we uh, understand uh, what the apostolic stands for, we pray, Lord, for the help of the Holy Spirit, Lord, to, to give us a clear idea so that, Lord, we can function, um, Lord, in this uh, anointing of the apostolic, Father. Thank you once again for this time in your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. So we will talk about the apostolic. Now, uh, we have some idea about the prophetic. Uh, and as I've been saying, though these are subjects that we learn, it's good to keep going back to it time and again. Because with practice, uh, with exposure, we are going to deepen our understanding. We broadly recognize what the prophetic stands for and how we're supposed to flow in it but the more we get into it the better our understanding becomes so i encourage us that uh, even though we finish this course keep coming back if there are uh, weekend schools keep attending if there's you know some seminars or uh, lectures uh, conferences it's good it's just good to learn more uh, about the prophetic similarly about every other subject so today we are going to touch upon the apostolic so in the apostolic we begin with an overview of what God is doing in the world and uh, how the Christian church has been through a restoration over the years, right after the early church days, which we also call as revival. So if you have done um, revival, visitations and moves of God, there is a chapter on just the book of Acts over there. Because... The Acts of the Apostles was a time when the glory of God was so heightened. There were miracles taking place. There were people getting saved by the thousands. Uh, society was being impacted. Leaders were being raised up. So amazing, amazing uh, things took place. And it was, it was a revival, you know, in, uh, in what the Lord was doing. And uh, so we see that as a high in Christian history. But right after that, we noticed that the church went through a period called as the Dark Ages, 400 to 1400 AD. So this was a time when there was persecution, there were many struggles, uh, and uh, the people who believed in God could not really gather, propagate their faith in a strong way. So we call them the Dark Ages. But thank God that the restorative move of God began. So from 1500 AD, it's as if uh, God was restoring little by little different aspects of the church. So there are people who ask the question. Uh, there was one sermon preached. Uh, if I'm not wrong. It was 2021. You can try and go look it up. Uh, it's about the church, you know, how the church will rise up in the last days. And um, even... Um, 
I think it's the book of James. Yeah, the book of James, where there's a reference to um, uh, the harvest. Okay, so uh, we, when we learn about the harvest, the harvest comes after the latter rain falls. And the latter rain is the move of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit falls on us, there is going to be a, a, a very powerful time where God brings in a lot of people into his kingdom. And that's what we're all waiting for, the end time revival. And we are waiting for a big harvest that scriptures have promised us. Uh, and uh, that is going to happen. Now, people ask the question, how can something so mighty happen? How is God going to do all this? Well, when we look at church history, we see that in about 500 years, God restored many things. And it's amazing that in 500 years, so much was restored back to the church. And even now, God is continuing to you know, restore back things to us. So God is at work. God is um, you know, in, in that place where he is ensuring that the church will rise up with knowledge and strength and uh, you know the grace that we need to see that revival which is going to take place so now uh, in those 500 years what are all some of the restorative moves of god that took place 1500 ad we see the understanding of grace the understanding of sal uh, salvation by grace through faith happen 1600 uh, puritan movement where uh, the revelation about baptism in water and separation of church and state was restored 1700s the holiness movement where you have people like uh, uh, john wesley and all they all stood up and they spoke about how the christian life must also have holiness it's not just about you know salvation and then we live however we want but holiness is important so there was an emphasis on holiness 1880 um, we see divine healing being restored to the church 1980 the pentecostal movement and the 2000s is when we are saying what is known as um, some people call it the saints movement and uh, we know that in ephesians chapter 4 verses 11 and 12 the word of god promises us that god gives the church um, the fivefold ministry offices uh, and because of the fivefold ministry offices the people of god are going to be equipped okay and when people are equipped then what happens people rise up and people begin to do the work of the ministry that's why some people call this call it as the saints movement because every saint will do the work of the ministry so from the 2000s that's what we are seeing that many believers are understanding who they are and all believers understand, uh, you know, are under, beginning to understand that there is a call of God on their lives and they start to step out. But for the equipping of the saints, we need the fivefold ministry offices. We need the anointing of the five, those offices. Like we talked about the prophetic anointing, right? So now the emphasis in this section of our courses the apostolic anointing so uh, god is pouring out that anointing god is releasing the apostolic but we have to understand what the apostolic stands for um i think i mentioned earlier that when it comes to the prophetic how do we prophesy uh, and uh, you know what what is prophecy all about we are still building our understanding of, about it so many times like terms like impartation right uh, we would find that those terms don't even exist in languages certain languages because there was no understanding nobody was preaching about it but now we are having understanding about those matters so slowly as it's being translated and communicated to uh, various communities we are learning those new terms because of the new understanding similarly when it comes to the apostolic our understanding is developing you could say yes we will teach many things in this course but we are still kind of uh, getting more and more clarity about it so that's how we should take it because um, god is restoring so you know uh, different sides of what this is about will become 
clearer and clearer as we go ahead so whatever is there in the world whatever is there in history that we will learn it but we may see that god can do something new within the apostolic also something that we have never seen because um you know now we are living in the technology age just last year i think uh, early last year is when chat gpt became a big deal not that it didn't exist before it did exist but um uh, it i mean ai existed but it was brought out more you know to the uh, brought out to the public uh, in a more accessible way early last year so similarly you know there are many other areas uh, which for the for the uh, kingdom of god you know are being explored today because as believers we are exploring all these areas so uh, the apostolic can be seen in all these areas also right so it's emerging in that sense but some of the foundations we are going to learn in our course fine so let's just begin with chapter 1 here we i'll try to summarize uh, the key teams and keep moving forward so we are beginning with the understanding that the lord jesus is an apostle okay now the lord jesus the beauty of this is that he was in the he was in all five offices five fold ministry offices we know the scriptures tell us that jesus had the spirit without measure so one of the understandings that it brings to us is that the anointing of god upon his life right there was no measure for that just give you the reference yeah spirit without measure yeah john 334 so when we study his life you remember he was called as a prophet isn't it a uh, prophet is not respected in his own uh you know in his own place who said that jesus said that so he was calling himself a prophet and what is he a pastor yes he is he is the good shepherd okay when we study the writings the epistles of uh, peter we'll see that he is the chief good he is the chief shepherd of us all so he is in the office of the pastor okay is he a teacher yes you know he taught the word of god he taught with authority we know people around him recognized uh, him as a teacher was he an evangelist yes he proclaimed the truth of god's word so he is in all the offices there is no we we can't think of any one person who is in all the offices can people be can people have one or two um such callings in the fivefold ministry office yeah so we can have someone who is a pastor prophet we can have someone who is an apostle teacher okay? but a person who has all five uh, five fold ministry anointings is the lord jesus nobody else is like him who carries the spirit without measure john 334 so jesus was an apostle we see this in hebrews chapter 3 and verse 1 so if someone can turn to that passage and read that will be helpful hebrews chapter 3 and verse 1 hebrew chapter 3 verse 1 yes therefore holy brethren partakers of the heavenly calling consider the apostle and high priest of our confession christ jesus yeah holy. that's enough so as it clearly shows there the apostle of our salvation so the bible we don't have to guess it anymore it's already there in scripture that he is the apostle of our salvation so we take it as it is he was an apostle now the question is we have to understand what is an apostle okay jesus was an apostle but what is an apostle who is an apostle so we'll try to build our understanding on that so the simplest meaning of an apostle is representative somebody who is a representative if we break up the word right the greek word apo apostolos from which the word apostle comes 
we see that apo stands for from and stolos stands for i send so the understanding of the word is somebody is sent from somebody so john 316 what does it say for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son he gave he sent his only begotten son so apo from stolos i sent from is who is from in this case in the case of jesus yeah jesus came from the father he came from the father he came to represent the father if you have seen me you have seen the father okay the express jesus the express express image of god so in every way jesus was a representative of god the father he came from the father uh, and he was sent from the father now that explains why the lord jesus is called as the apostle and high priest of our salvation because he was a sent one a sent one so we are understanding right apostle means representative apostle means somebody who sent from somewhere apostle means we can also say delegate who is a delegate delegate is a representative who is usually vested with some power and authority we delegate someone to do a work but when we tell them hey can you please do this we give them the authority so if we let's say we uh, delegate someone to go make a purchase of some items we give them the the authority yes you can purchase you can make decisions whether you can buy this or you can't buy that so without authority it's very hard to delegate because that person will not have he'll have zero power and for everything they'll call you then what's the point of delegating that person so whenever we delegate someone for any form of a task it comes along with a uh, responsibility and authority so that is who a representative or or a delegate is so representative is somebody who is representing another person delegate is someone who has been sent to do the work on behalf of another person so this word apostolos uh, is also a secular term because it was used by the greeks and the romans in those days and we know that you know back then it was all about uh, military rule it was all about conquering uh, communities and land and you know uh, establishing their own kingdom that's how they function so for the greeks and the romans they would send an envoy okay an envoy is like a military team uh with the agenda of conquering a land they were representatives of a certain nation they would go to a new nation and conquer so that was their job they were called as apostles they were called apostolos they were sent from the government or the authority of you know one particular uh, uh, ruler and they'll go to another place they will conquer they'll conquer and what they would also do is see it's one thing to have a piece of land or let's take for example that uh, nation 1 has conquered nation 2 so they've come into nation 2 but in nation 2 they have their own culture they have their own way of living they have everything their own so people of nation a have come in and uh, you know they now what to do in nation 2 so basically what the envoy used to do is one is of course conquer second is they'll establish their dominion fully so then what they would actually do is they would um they would start changing the system of two nation two how do they change the system of nation two they would do it by force they would do it by instruction they would do it by you know changing leaders they would do it by all these methods because what they were actually trying to do is they were trying to um change the culture and uh, 
the the entire system so that one and two look similar so that that's when they used to say yeah we've like fully taken over so you no longer have the culture of your um, earlier kingdom so they would just override it they will override it they'll say okay we get done with this old ways all new ways this is how you should do business this is how you should do politics this is how you should you know have education old education get rid of it we'll teach our you know our uh, teachings so then what happens every generation now begins to think yeah we are actually we belong to one we belong to nation one so that's how they used to conquer they used to go to different places establish their own ways all throughout and then that's why you hear things like roman empire right so they've conquered pieces of land they put their uh, leaders they have their government rule and that's how they did it so true apostolic was that so it was not just enter one place but establish your own ways in that place so that was ap ap apostolic and uh, you had military teams that were called as apostles who would go you know it's in other words um, we understand ambassadors have you heard ambassadors nowadays you have ambassadors of various nations uh, and they are representative of their nation but ambassadors you know in today's context they come and they dwell in another nation to uh, coordinate and communicate but apostles was more like a powerful term of conquering and establishing okay so i hope we have a better idea of what an apostle was so now in the context of uh, the bible in the context of the kingdom of god in the context of uh, <coughs> us as believers what does the apostolic stand for the apostolic broadly stands for establishing the kingdom of god so wherever the kingdom of darkness exists same like how we saw the early apostles uh military leaders go and take over we are supposed to go and take over right uh, and taking over we are not talking about conquering land or doing things uh like in the natural as such but our emphasis is a very spiritual one where the kingdom of heaven thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven so when we go and establish the kingdom of heaven on earth what is that it's apostolic because who which nation are we representing it's it's not about any earthly thing but it's more about the kingdom of god that's what we are uh, focusing in on over here right so the kingdom of god can be established in the lives of people can be established in the lives of you know any and every community so that is the true apostolic now when we look at the bible there were apostles named in the early church who are these apostles we see a couple of categories so one is known as uh, one set is known as apostles of the lamb apostles of the lamb can someone please turn to revelation chapter 21 and verse 14 Revelation twenty one verse fourteen. Now the uh, wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Yes. So you see, even there, it calls the twelve apostles as the twelve apostles of the Lamb. So why twelve apostles of the Lamb? yeah because jesus had 12 disciples so lamb is jesus behold the lamb of god john the baptist said jesus is the lamb of god so these 12 people are the apostles so then there's no doubt about it they are apostles 12 of them now who are these 12 people ask questions judas is there or judas is not there all those questions right but like if you look at acts chapter 1 verses 20 to 26 Judas is not there because he betrayed Christ but they do a uh, I mean they pray yeah replacement 
and Matthias. Matthias is taken into the 12. So our understanding is uh, most likely the 12th one will be Matthias and not uh, Judas. Okay. So these 12 people are already the Bible is calling them apostles. So then we accept it. Yes, they are apostles and they fall under the category of apostles of the Lamb. And how many are there in that? Only 12. Only 12. So that's clear. Okay, great. Now, are there more apostles in the Bible? F first of all, Jesus, then 12 uh, apostles. Then now, the Bible talks about founding apostles. There is another category, founding apostles. Who are these people? Uh, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20. Ephesians 2 verse 20. Yes. Having been built on the foundations of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Hmm. So it's talking about the establishing of the church. So how is the church established? How is any building up, uh, established? So in those days, when uh, you talked about architecture, they had this concept of the cornerstone. So today we talk about, you know, some beams, pillars and weight bearing walls. But those days they had a concept of the cornerstone. A lot of the weight of the building would fall on that one uh, structure, cornerstone. So uh, Paul is writing to the Ephesians and he's saying Jesus is the cornerstone. Everything rests on Jesus. But then there is also the foundations of the apostles and the prophets. So the church, how is the church built? How is the church standing? There, it is standing also on the foundation of apostles and prophets. Okay, so foundation of apostles and prophets. Who are these founding apostles and prophets? We can go back to those who gave us the doctrines. Okay, what are doctrines? What are doctrines? What is our understanding of doctrine? Yeah, correct. In a sense, it's the main teachings, the core teaching. Like Paul writes to uh, Timothy, he says, don't ever forget the core teachings that Jesus Christ died for us. Uh, you know, he bore our sins. He... Um, uh, he died, he was resurrected. These are the core teachings. Imagine if the church doesn't have this. So it's very scary. Actually, the times that we are living in right now, people are preaching all kinds of gospels, which does not have the core doctrine. And how can you even say that it is biblical? You can't. So we must be very careful never to uh, manipulate the core doctrine. Or we are just calling it doctrine. Like if, if there's no Christ, if there's no humanity of Christ, uh, you know, if, if there's no um, Jesus dying on the cross and uh, buying our salvation, then what we are believing today doesn't exist only. So those are the doctrines. These are all key things. The blood of Jesus, like this weekend pastor preached, the blood of Jesus, the name of Jesus. You know, our faith is based on these things. And it cannot be like there is, we, we cannot tolerate any minor change in the core doctrines, right? The, the doctrine has to be there. Who is the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit? These are non-negotiables. That's what the doctrine means, that our faith is established on this. So when we say founding apostles, there are apostles in scripture who have given us those core, um, you know, writings. God worked through them, inspired them to put it down. People like Paul, right? People like John, people like uh, Peter. You can read all the things that they have written. And they've established us in the doctrine of God's word. Okay, uh, And that cannot be changed. Those are the founding apostles. Now today... We may have people who are giving us a depth of understanding. 
of the core doctrines. For example, let's say the blood of Jesus. Maybe some of us, you know, we are writing books, we are teaching on it. But what exactly are we doing? We are just discovering the depths of what has been established. We cannot bring anything uh, new in a sense, as in we can't add to the core that has already been given to us. So if there is an apostle who is uh, bringing in-depth revelation of God's word, while they can be an apostle, they can be a teacher, they can be shedding light on the doctrine, they will never be a founding apostle. Because founding apostles are already in history now. You know, people like Paul and Peter and, you know, John and all, already done. It's done. Founding apostles. We no longer have founding apostles. So doctrine is already established. Got it? So there's no compromise on it. Okay, so this is what the apostles of the Lamb, the founding apostles, very important because what does the Bible say? The Bible says the church is established on apostles, prophets, and Jesus as the cornerstone. Uh, and there are founding apostles. Um, okay, so let's move on. Now, does, does that scripture uh, not include other apostles? It does. But we need to be clear that those who have given the doctrine have done it already. So today if somebody comes and says, hey, I'm an apostle and uh, I got a revelation from heaven and uh, they teach something new or they teach something contrary to the established doctrine, we cannot accept that. Okay, So that's how it works. Now moving on, we have something new. Yes, yes. Uh, is there anywhere like uh, it was written like uh, there is no add-ons? I mean, like to the Bible or to the core doctrines. Is there any verse that says like no add-ons? I mean, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which which one, Sri Radha? See, I can think of Ephesians chapter four and verse uh, thirteen. I'll read it out for you. Okay, maybe 14, verse 14. See, uh, in uh, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14, it says, earlier it's talking about uh, God has given apostles, prophets, teachers, uh, evangelists, pastors uh, for the equipping of the saints so that they can become a mature man, fullness of the stature of Christ. And verse 14, it says that we should no longer be tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. That simply means new doctrine. Every wind of doctrine means Something new is being taught. And uh, Paul is saying we should, every believer should become so mature that when this new doctrines come, we should be able to identify it. Otherwise, what will we be like? We will be like, uh, he says, see, like children. When children hear something exciting, they'll, they'll go that side. Then somebody else will come, they'll say something new, they'll go the other side. So, that is foolishness. That's not a sign of maturity. So don't be tossed to and fro about with every wind of doctrine. So new doctrine. Anand, new things. Huh? The context here is um, Paul is talking to the leaders of the church. So this actually, if you go back and look at Acts chapter 20, uh, that's the place where Paul goes to meet the Ephesian elders. And if you read what he's speaking to the elders, he says, uh, I'm going away, but I want to warn you. There are going to be, he, uh, I forget the word, he says something like deceitful wolves will rise up against you. And he's referring to false teachers 
false prophets and the doctrines which they are going to bring. So in that context, we, we have to understand Ephesians 4, where he's saying that every believer, sh we should equip them so that they become mature. When these teachings come, wind of doctrine, new things come, they should not you know, sway this side, that side, but they should be strong in what we have already taught them. So that's the way. Yeah. Um, Peter talks about it in uh, Second Peter. If you read that book, if you read uh, the writing of Jude, Jude talks about it that in the last days there'll be a lot of false things going around, but one should be established in the core doctrine. Hmm. Yeah. So that that way. So we are not saying you know when we say new. Just be careful about new things. We're not saying depth of revelation. See, depth of revelation is fine. Doctrine is already established. See, blood of Jesus, for example. If we go back to the old times, if you listen to some of the sermons, there'll be some revelation. But as you're listening, right, you'll see that, hey, new, new things we are discussing. It's already there in the Bible. But we are getting the understanding of it in a stronger way and uh, I mean it, it's amazing how that same subject somebody once mentioned this and it's helpful for me they said every word of God just for our understanding think of it like a bucket right a bucket a bucket full of water so that word uh, is a bucket full of water maybe the first time you're reading it you get a drop out of it, right? The second time you're reading it, you get another drop out of it. The third time you're reading it, you get... it's the same word. It's the same verse, right? It's the same uh, truth, but there is depth in it. You're just getting more and more and more. Now imagine, actually speaking, each word of God is not a bucket. It's an ocean, right? So there is no end to the understanding, the depth of that word actually so when we are going deeper in the lord scripture says right grow in the grace and knowledge of our lord jesus christ how to grow if there's nothing to learn but the fact is there is so much to learn we'll never we can never reach the end right so that's okay when we are going into the depth of the word is okay but wrong doctrine opposite doctrine Right? Things that will mess up what has already been established by founding apostles like Paul and you know all these other people, that we cannot accept. That's what we are saying. Yeah. I understand this. The doctrine won't be changed at any time, mm -hmm. but the revelation, what we are getting or some any yeah. people are getting, yeah. it's from it's from the word only. It won't yes. contradict also. Yeah. Like one one time. For one one person, mm. it will be different understanding. With Correct. So we call it new revelations. Yeah, people call it new revelation, but it's actually like depth. You're going uh. deeper into the same truth. Truth mm. is not changing. So that's fine. But revelations should not uh, contradict the word. No, no, no. Whatever, whatever people say the revelations, we should definitely see the word of God. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. We have to. Mm. Yeah, sure. Okay, so I think we've um, got that understanding. Okay, so then what is the next category of apostles? The next category is Ephesians chapter 4, where scripture says God has given to the church, right? Apostles, prophets, teachers. So that also means that even today, there are apostles. Because how will the saints be equipped if God does not give um, you know, these, these fivefold ministry offices? And we are saying that from 2000s, God is re-establishing, He's restoring the fivefold ministry offices. When we studied about the prophetic, we said that there is the office of a prophet. So even today, we can have some people who are in the office of a prophet. That also means that even today, 
there is the office of the apostle. And there are people who are in the office of the apostle. Right? So there is no scripture that says that after the founding apostles and 12 apostles of the Lamb, there are no more ap apostles. There is no such reference. Okay? So, which is why we do believe that even today, there are apostles among us. God calls some people to be apostles in the body of Christ. What is their work? Same. Remember we said establishing the kingdom. So, we'll see. We'll see what the anointing carries. When we studied about the prophetic, we saw the anointing is about revealing the heart of the Father. Isn't it? Prophetic. You hear from God. What are you sensing? What are you seeing? Uh, what are you hearing? That's the anointing. It brings revelation about what God is saying in the now. What is the apostolic? Apostolic anointing is carrying the anointing to establish the kingdom. Okay? So there are people who spearhead the establishing of the kingdom in various... Uh, areas and um, yeah, various spheres around us, and uh, yeah, that is something that we need to accept that there are still apostles, just that they cannot add a book to the Bible doctrine, they can't write. Okay, they cannot be part of uh, the 12 disciples of Jesus, but they are apostles because it's a ministry gift that God gives. As per Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Yeah. Uh, what we are telling is uh, like uh, from the Bible. So, uh, like, I, I have this doubt from long, long mm. back. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I've read all this, but I don't have a satisfactory answer to support all my answers, what we are giving. I believe. Yes. Yeah. So, like, if someone is asking, what is the need for apostles? Mm. Like re-establishment of God's kingdom. Yeah. So for that, this fivefold ministry will come. Yeah. Then apostles are there. Yes. So, uh, like, can we support our statements by any particular verses? Mm -hmm. That is the first thing. And the second thing is, if if God's doctrine is already like there, it was established, and it was it was not changed. It's not gonna. I mean, it won't be added anything. So then, what is the need of apostles like mm -hmm. uh, other than this carrying god's uh, kingdom or god's word mm -hmm. other than that what is the core reason mm -hmm. i mean what we can give for them like mm -hmm. the first one is the yeah scriptures scripture yeah to support so, our statement yeah see like for it i go back to ephesians chapter 4 verses 11 and 12 god gives Gifts to the gifts to the church, uh, apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, evangelists. Do we accept there are pastors today? Yes. Do we accept there are evangelists today? Do we accept there are teachers today? Do we accept there are prophets today? And why is there such a problem when it comes to apostles? Same verse, no. Same breath. He has given all, and uh, like you. If there is a scripture that says he is not given or he has stopped, then we can accept it that, okay, you know, something has changed. But when all four other ministry offices, we don't have a problem. When it comes to apostle, we have a problem. Uh, I, now, I do understand maybe because of, again, abuse of that office. You got it? Like, see, when it came to prophecy, also we discussed so much saying uh, sometimes wrong things are done wrong in a wrong way. So for us to accept prophecy becomes so difficult. It's not that God is stopped, but the way it has been done is affecting people from accepting it. So, see, this one verse itself is clear, right? If all other four, we, we know that, yes, God is having people in those offices, then how can just one office be exempted? Even apostle God is sending today. They are there. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So, I'll. Uh, this is the one scripture I can think of. If I can think of another, I'll tell you. The second question you asked is, uh, if they cannot establish the doctrine, right? Something you said. Uh, then, what is it? Purpose. Yeah, so 
we we will see uh, anand when we do the next chapter we'll study about the characteristics of apostles in the early times see they have a function what was their function just take for example paul for your understanding i'm saying when you think of paul what do you think of you think of a man who uh, who has the grace of god to enter new territory he entered like you know uh, greece he entered uh, uh, ephesus he entered um, thessalonica he, i mean he just kept going moving on here there rome he went wherever he went uh, churches were established like some 40 churches you know he <coughs> he's connected to leaders were raised up and that is the apostolic anointing we talked about establishing the kingdom so if there's no apostle like paul all this would not have happened right i mean god is working through the life of an apostle to take the kingdom of god from place to place and uh, make an impact so that is why we need apostles even today we have some people like that whom who have the grace of god you you look at them and you go like how you know how how can they think like that how can they move like that but is the grace of god on their lives it's an apostolic grace and it conquers territory spiritual territory what we are speaking about yeah so that's how it is we need them we need them in the church so ma'am like like in the in the when we see prophetic mm. so there are stages like all believers can prophesy mm. and then that is the gift gift yeah. of prophecy grace gift of prophecy yes. office yes so is there something like this in apostles also hmm. is 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 anything is there like that and the other thing is like how we can call people as apostles hmm. like only the only uh, thing that we can tell is if they establish kingdom of god in a greater way hmm. or is there any other things also like apostle paul this this so there are so many pastors who establishes kingdom who establishes hmm. a plenty of churches hmm. Yes. Okay. So, good questions. You'll have to refresh the first question. Uh, no, there is like prof in prophet uh, the gift ah, yeah, of yeah, prophecy. Yeah. Ah, all believers can prophesy. Okay, correct. Yeah. So, see, we can make the statement that all believers can be prophetic. Yes or no? All believers cannot be prophets, but all believers can be prophetic. same is true for the apostolic all believers cannot be apostles all believers can be apostolic okay so we can conquer new new territory for god it's possible so in our guest lectures most of the time you have people who done like you think how did they do it in that area that community that's very apostolic something new new ministry so all believers can be apostolic uh, and the second question you said call an apostle yeah so how can we call so see we will constantly see uh, just because a believer is apostolic or a pastor is apostolic they are not apostle they don't become apostle so we will see uh, repeated affirmation of the apostolic characteristics in their lives okay then only we can say that this person is an apostle so generally generally how we could say is we'll we'll observe the ministry that god has done through the like for example again going back to back to paul when you see what god did through his life it's so clear you can say my goodness that's an apostle so that's how we recognize usually we have to wait for the work to happen and then we are able to tell that yeah they are apostle yeah so i i mean it's hard to say it in the beginning before the work gets done so generally that's how we do it it by the
yeah by their work which we understand now but they were also chosen see there are two things we'll come to it in the making of an apostle one is through our ministry we can identify what fruit that person is bearing based on that you can say they are an apostle but also you see many times god already speaks for example paul already knew that he is going to be an apostle to the gentiles i can know that i am called to be a prophet or an apostle or a teacher or whatever but how do i start getting called a prophet or an apostle when i do the work so there's both ways one may already know that they have a call but for people to call somebody that first the ministry has to happen no then only they'll identify yeah you're an apostle okay great so we'll stop at this i know this is a new subject uh, so think about it read through about it and uh, we'll discuss more in the upcoming classes so let's pray and close uh, i request one of us from the class to kindly pray today dear holy father thank you lord thank you for the class oh lord thank you for all the understanding oh lord help us to get more revelations oh lord help us to understand in a greater way and a deeper way oh lord help us to glorify you through all these things by knowing a lot i submit the subject and ma'am into your hands in jesus name i pray amen amen, amen. thank you bye for now god bless